Hello everybody, this is Odd Job Entertainment bringing you another video. Let me tell you, I am disproportionately excited by a new addition to Star Citizen that most people probably will not appreciate to nearly the same level. That is the improvements to FPS weapons, specifically optics. Optics is a whole subfield of engineering, and I don't pretend to have a graduate level of knowledge in the area. But this is a personal interest of mine, and so when they showed off these new improvements, I was stoked. Starting with the most basic of sights, we've got the good old iron sights. This is where the 1911 peers can jump in and talk about the two world wars and shame modern weapons that need such high tech coddling. Iron sights have existed on weapons nearly as long as they themselves have existed. The way they work is fairly simple. You have a rear sight and a front sight. You use your eye to line both of these up with your target. Like I said, dead simple. There's some problems with this, however. Your eye can only focus on one point at a time. With this setup, you have three options. You can either focus on the rear sight, the front sight, or the target. As your eye transitions from each focal point, you're likely to make slight movements that can affect your aim. This leads to several different schools of doctrine where you're taught to focus exclusively on one of the three points and allow your peripheral vision to worry about the rest. For example, if you focus on the target, you can still reasonably well get your sights in line using the slightly blurred outline in your vision to do so. Another limitation of iron sights is sight radius. This is the distance between your rear and front sight. Generally speaking, the shorter this radius, the more inherent inaccuracy you can expect. This makes intuitive sense. Handguns are less accurate than rifles, right? You're not going to get a headshot at 100 yards with a Glock, regardless of how much I love my own. The math behind this is also pretty easy to understand. If we imagine a one degree shift relative to the rear sight, this results in a triangular path in front of the weapon. The closer we are to the rear sight, the smaller the perpendicular distance between these lines becomes. But the farther out we are, that distance increases. This results in a more obvious visual change that is easier to account for. So how do video games get around these issues? Well, since a video game doesn't truly have depth due to the simple fact that it is being displayed on a 2D monitor, they can simply ignore a lot of these depth issues. Games apply blur to create a sense of depth, but that on its own is fake. It's an effect to give a more realistic impression. Some games, like Battlefield 2042, take this a step further and apply some blur to the rear sight while leaving the front sight and target in focus. This is similar to the effect you get naturally looking through aperture sights, as the rear donut does help maintain some of the focus on the front sight when looking at your target. This is due to something called collimation, and we'll go more in depth on that later on. Now, because it's a game, the developers can just have everything be in focus, and that's what many publishers do. As a player, you may never have noticed this yourself because you're focused on the target. Your eyes still have the limitation of only being able to focus on one thing at a time. In the context of your monitor, that means you can only focus on one section at a time. So developers can actually take things in and out of focus without you even noticing. This is part of how the PSVR 2 is able to render at higher frame rates. It literally watches your eye and moves the higher dedication of graphic resources to whatever point you're looking at. But as it pertains to the iron sights and guns in game, go ahead and load up your favorite title and see how the focus changes when you aim down sight. Or if you're a Counter-Strike 2 sweat, leave a comment below about how aim down sight is trash and real men don't need it. Asserting your dominance on the internet will surely go a long way to help you make friends. As we move into what can be classified as close quarters combat sites, I have to say that in doing my own research both to collect footage and information, I had to completely restructure how I intended to deliver this information. The differences in the way these look in real life, through my eyes, is difficult to convey on camera, so I'm going to do my best to supplement the real world footage with my own diagrams and experiences to explain it for the sake of my audience. Stepping up from the humble iron sights, most games and consumers go into red dot sights, or reflex sights. These are often used interchangeably because the technology is identical between them. The primary benefit of the weapon sights we're discussing today is that they all allow you to shoot with both eyes open. This is great because it implies that the target is at the same focal plane as your reticle. 
meaning that you don't have to change your focus between the two planes. This allows you to maintain much better peripheral vision as well as tactical awareness, while also being able to aim faster and more accurately compared to Iron Sight's equivalents. Red Dot, at its core, uses a LED tucked behind a pinhole screen. This allows only a small cone of light to escape. To the naked eye, this seems similar to a laser, but there are some fundamental differences as we'll get into. This narrow beam cone is reflected off a semi-mirrored, curved piece of glass toward the shooter's eye. The result is a small red dot, in most cases due to the red LED used as a light source. Modern red dots often have more complicated reticles. They achieve this by using a more complicated grate that allows additional sections of light to come out, or they can have additional LEDs that can be selectively toggled, or a combination of the two. In this example, this is a cheap reproduction of a red dot for use on an airsoft gun. It has a selectable reticle, and it does this by moving a different physical screen in front of the emitter. This mechanism unfortunately means that you can release the dial at different degree increments and have a noticeable shift in aim. More professional sites will either skip having selectable reticles or use additional LEDs to create other parts of the image, but as they're all statically mounted, this shouldn't cause any target shift. The curve of the glass is very important for this effect. Most red dots use spherically cut lenses, meaning that the individual lens is part of a much larger sphere. Bouncing the light off of this curve from the focal point of the lens results in a collimated reticle. This means the reticle can be thought of as an infinite column of light extending in both directions between your eye and your target. In essence, this means that regardless of what the initial angle of the light was before it hit the glass, the exit trajectory will always be the same and parallel to any other initial angles as well. In theory, this means that when you move your head, as humans often do, the reticle should still reflect where the gun is going to fire. One downside to a red dot, however, is that a spherical lens is not actually the ideal shape. Rather, a parabolic lens is ideal, at least from the math perspective. But parabolic lenses are significantly more expensive and difficult to manufacture due to their shape. The vast majority of red dots compromise then and use spherical sections instead. And this means that the collimation is not perfect and can have a level of variance contributing to parallax. Parallax is when the shown point of impact of the reticle is different from where the weapon will actually fire. Shooters mitigate this with training, particularly to always try to get the same relative position between the gun and their head, but this is not possible to do perfectly and parallax will always be somewhat present. Another downside to a red dot is that since it is a simple LED shining through a restrictive gate, you can get fringing on the reticle. This is caused by diffraction. Essentially, as the light exits the gate, it has a chance to change its trajectory slightly. So while the desired effect of the grate is a straight column of light, you get several narrow tapers instead. And this scattering results in an unfocused image that can be particularly bothersome if you have astigmatism. This is one thing that is difficult to show on camera. My camera has better eyesight than I do, so instead of the starburst effect I see from a red dot, the camera just sees more bloom in the lighting. On my more expensive sight that I have on my AR, I can get the brightness very high and exaggerate the effect much more so than I can with the cheap airsoft sights. But the camera doesn't pick up the starbursting I see in person. If you have perfect vision, this doesn't apply to you anyway, but it's something to consider if you do wear glasses. Another obvious difference between these two red dots and their respective price range is the optical clarity. Because a red dot relies on a reflection off the glass, there will always be some level of tint on a red dot. If the glass allowed all the light to come through, that's a two-way street, and you wouldn't see the reticle. However, more expensive sights, as we see on the AR, will employ all kinds of trickery with different coatings to try to diminish the tint while still having a clear reticle. Now that we have a pretty clear understanding of how a red dot works, let's look at how these real-world examples compare to their counterparts in video games. As far as the reticle fringing, a lot of games do this surprisingly well, if not a little bit exaggerated at times. Tarkov being one of the better examples. Call of Duty Modern Warfare also does a pretty good job with this effect. But neither game, however, and 
all the games that I've been able to see bother to include the lens tint reliably in the correct color or at the correct level. This is a very minor detail with little bearing on gameplay, but since we're talking specifically about optics, it's worth at least mentioning. Surprisingly, <coughs> surprisingly, as we can see in this footage from Tigerfield, GTA 5 gets a bonus point here for depicting how a reticle can be more blown out against darker objects. As the camera pans from the night sky onto a white rooftop, a lot of the scattering is less noticeable. Pouring over the limited footage we have of the upcoming weapon sites in Star Citizen, I haven't actually seen a red dot site, so I'm not sure how they stack up yet. What they've shown in the most recent ISC and in CitizenCon were some of their holographic sites, which are fundamentally different from a red dot. Moving on to holographic sites then, these seem very similar to red dots, and to the general shooter, they really are. You need to be training to a high level to really extract the details and benefits between them, but they do function entirely different from each other. And let me tell you, this is where a lot of my research time went. First off, a holographic sight uses a laser diode instead of an LED. A laser emits coherent light, meaning that all the particles are in phase with each other. We often think of lasers being a straight beam, but that's not necessarily the case. That would be collimated light. A laser is coherent, but not perfectly collimated. The farther out a typical laser goes, the wider an area it will cover, just not expanding nearly as quickly as other light sources. The first thing an EOTech does then, which has been the de facto holographic sight for over 20 years, is collimate the light to ensure it is actually one straight beam. It does this by reflecting the light up and onto a collimating mirror. Now the light exiting the mirror is much better collimated than it was before. From the mirror, it bounces down onto a holographic grating. And you might think this is where the reticle is, and you'd be forgiven for this, but it's not. <laughs> Instead, the holographic grating is to compensate for any incoherence of our light caused either by thermal drift, the collimation introducing some distortion on its own, or anything else. And it does this by reflecting only the light waves that are in phase with each other, while anything out of sync needs to take an extra bounce or two so that when it does reflect off, it's in phase with its neighbors. Now that the light is both coherent and collimated, it's perfect for illuminating a holographic reticle. This is etched onto the rear sight glass where it's protected by a sandwich of normal boring glass. And when you hear the word etched, you probably think of scratching your name into a tree with the name of your girlfriend at the time promising to never break up. But unlike that heart, which actually just tells everyone afterward that two losers were near a tree, this hologram is much more subtle. The science behind how these are formed is borderline witchcraft. The glass is perfectly clear until it's hit by our special laser light. And our reticle is special in that it is a 3D image. When you look through it, you are seeing a projection of a three-dimensional scene. The Thought Emporium has a lengthy video showing how holograms are made. A very similar process is being used here. We take an object and place it on a stage, and then we hit it with part of a laser that was split off from itself using a prism. The other half of the beam bypasses the object and bounces straight onto the holographic media. When both of these sections of light hit the holographic material, they interfere with each other, creating areas of light and dark called an interference pattern. The holographic media records this pattern, and when the glass carrying this pattern is later illuminated by normal light, nothing happens. But when you hit it with the right laser light, your image of the object in 3D space is revealed. In the case of our holographic site, this means that we have a recreation of a reticle with a very distant focus that superimposes itself on the target. One possible critique of holographic sites is that the reticle can appear blurry. If we think of this as a 3D photo, it makes sense why. The reticle is composed essentially of pixels. These pixels can only get so small. And just like noise in a photograph, the reticle will also have slight variances in the brightness of each individual pixel. At higher brightness settings, a holographic site will also exhibit some bloom. It's behaving kind of like its own light source, so the brighter it is, the more blown out it will appear, just like looking at the sun. 
And this being YouTube, I now have to warn you, don't look at the sun. A properly illuminated reticle will actually have a more crisp structure to it compared to a comparable red dot. This has a number of advantages over the much more simple red dot sight. First off, because we are not relying on the reflectivity of the glass, we don't need to tint the lens. This gives a clearer image with less color distortion. And since the reticle shape is not a product of a physical grate, there's no diffraction, and so the astigmatic starburst effect is also reduced. Because we are not relying on a curved piece of glass to provide final collimation, we also do experience less parallax. We already are using collimated light before the holographic grating corrects the coherence, so the reticle only ever comes in contact with perfect light, so to speak. On the much more simple red dot, the glass does the collimation directly and coherence be damned though coherence is not a requirement in the case of the red dot. If we push our view out to the edge of the glass, we see inherent distortion. If we do the same panning test on the holographic, no such distortion is observed. Because such care is taken in an EOTech to ensure that light is perfect, the advertised 1 MOA dot is always 1 MOA, or whatever advertised size they say it is. This also means that if the reticle is magnified, due to the higher quality collimation of a holographic sight, the dot size remains the same relative to the target, whereas the less precise red dot can experience some slight variation where a 2MOA dot is no longer a 2MOA dot. Both of these optics are often touted as being parallax free, but this isn't the case. They both do experience parallax. The high precision required for manufacturing the holographic reticle does reduce some of this by the nature of its mechanism, and as mentioned before, we're not relying on any curved pieces of glass. So an EOTech does have less parallax than a red dot, but both optics will be truly parallax free at their focus point, which is often 100 yards. Inside and outside that specific range, both sites will start to accrue parallax. At larger ranges, it becomes harder to tell without magnification. But at extremely short ranges, such as 3 feet, it's pretty obvious. If we move our head relative to the site, we can see our predicted impact point change. If we were to bump up the distance, the change is significantly less noticeable. For the intended ranges these sites are used though, the amount of parallax is what's known in the industry as good enough. These are close quarters combat oriented sites and the only real metric is whether you come back and your enemy doesn't. A 1 MOA shift on a target's face still turns them into soup. soup. With the mass fame of holographic sights in the media, you'd expect that a lot of detail is put into how it looks on screen. Well, that would be nice. Rainbow Six Siege has essentially a static image that ignores a lot of the nuance of the reticle. You don't see a lot of the brightness variation. Games, of course, always have to make compromises between realism and playability. In highly competitive shooters, I guess I can understand that just making the reticle really clear may be better for some play scenarios. Call of Duty is another offender, and one of the worst ones, in that these details are the exact same as they are on the red dot sites. A good presentation of a holographic in a game would have little to no fringing, and brightness variation within a bright, crisp reticle. Tarkov does this quite well. So does Star Citizen's new update, so far as I've been able to tell. One thing evident in their representation of these reticles is that the reticle bounces at a different rate compared to the rest of the site housing. This is what happens and what you would experience in real life as the reticle should be moving relative to the barrel of the weapon. This will cause the barrel and reticle to move lockstep with each other, but other elements such as the sight housing may appear to move slightly differently due to your forced perspective. The attention to detail is clearly evident here. One advantage that is never really explored with holographic sights is the potential for a 3D reticle. EOTech has done this twice themselves, but since they only really compete with themselves, there's been no incentive to really innovate. But remember that our reticle is a 3D image. So if you wanted to have different elements at different depths, you totally could. In a futuristic setting like Star Citizen, this is a perfect excuse to do so. 
If a holographic sight were mounted on the railgun, for instance, you could have the various sized triangles move proportionally to each other to help line up a shot. 900 years in the future, we probably have compact laser projectors too, right? So a dynamic reticle that feeds you range data or other overlays in conjunction with your combat visor would also be possible. Maybe we'll see something like this in future editions. Maybe whenever they add thermal and night vision. Mechanisms like what I'm describing are already behind the HUDs used in aerospace today, providing mission critical information to pilots in the heat of battle or just taxiing on a runway. With the advent of the NGSW program and the sister project to develop an accompanying optic for the US military, we'd likely see similar overlays in the much smaller package of a rifle scope. Though of course, we're still waiting on War Thunder players to leak what the actual overlays look like as they are currently still top secret. There is a civilian model that doesn't have as much special sauce, but for video games, we want the real stuff, right? As we wrap up our observations, I want to clarify the functional differences between red dots and holographic sites. Red dots have become ubiquitous due to their simplicity, but that simplicity is also its weakness. Imperfect collimation and compromises on lens shape result in a reticle that experiences more fringing, starbursting, and distortion, especially at the edges of the glass. In comparison, the much more expensive holographic site has a more defined structure to the reticle, has brightness variations shaped like pixels, but has no such lens distortion and lower parallax overall. It has the added benefit of being three-dimensional and so can accommodate any reticle you desire with the catch that you can't change them as easily. Both red dots and holographic sights allow you to shoot with both eyes open. This is one major advantage over iron sights as it allows much faster target acquisition while maintaining excellent situational awareness. And this is one area where unfortunately games do let us down some. I've seen it suggested that the sight housing could be blurred so that only the reticle is really visible. This would be interesting to see, but I think most players would not like the effect. Gamers like to see their pretty guns, so blurring what so often represents a significant time investment isn't going to pan over well. With what I've been able to see of the update for Star Citizen, I think I'll be pleasantly surprised by how these sites are represented in-game. If you learned something today, let me know in the comments below. I plan to follow up with a future video talking about thermal, night vision, prisms, and longer range magnified optics. If that's something that interests you, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out. I've got one more thing to talk about before we go, and that is the intro you're about to watch was shot at Ready Gunner in Orem, Utah. Unfortunately, I did not bring my nicer microphone with me, but these guys were super cool in letting me get the footage that I needed in order to show the direct comparisons between a holographic site and a red dot. So those guys are awesome, and I just want to give them a shout out. Again, that's Ready Gunner in Orem, Utah. So if you're looking for any firearm supplies, ammo, attachments, whatever it is, they've got it, and they're great guys to work with. Uh, you'll probably be seeing more footage of me here in the future because they actually invited me to come back and shoot more optic footage. So I'm really excited for that as well. But ladies and gentlemen, until next time, this is Odd Job Entertainment, signing off.